Great pleasure to meet and introduce Adam Healy. Uh, Adam uh, well, will be known to quite a few of you because he actually has been here before. He was a PhD student with, with Coffee uh, and working on uh, eucalypt genomes. Uh, during his time with Coffee, he uh, he went on, on with support, I think, from the, the Coffee and UQ programs to to work. Uh, in, uh, in the US, and I think they, they liked his work so much they offered him a job, so uh, he's relocated there. But he's come back to Australia, I believe, to attend a eucalypt mm -hmm. meeting in Tasmania, mm -hmm. and he's taking the opportunity to visit us while he's here. So uh, Adam's in a great position to give us an update on the current status of plant genomic research uh, because of his role uh, with uh, Hudson Alpha. So, Adam, welcome. Thank you very much, Robert. So, hi everyone. Uh, it's great to be back in Australia. You don't really realize how much you miss the place until you come back and you know catch up with the friends and see the Aussie attitude of you know laid back. I saw a recent shark victim on the news describing the shark attack as the shark having a bit of a go at him, and <laughs> didn't realize how endearing that is and how much you miss it. So. Uh, my name's Adam. I'm a computational uh, biologist with the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology. And this is my talk on the current state of plant genomic research. I think we can all agree that's a pretty lofty title, but it's just an excuse for me to come back to Australia and talk to you about all the really interesting things that I've got to do over the, since leaving here three years ago. Species. I've lost the ability to change. Um, let's go page. This was working. <laughs> ah, perfect. So just a brief uh, overview of the presentation today. So I'll give you just an introduction to myself and what we do at Hudson Alpha. Briefly, I'll go over the sequencing, assembling, and building of plant genomic references. Uh, the main meat of the presentation will be genome analysis. So this is the part that I do. Uh, tell you a little bit about uh, building pangenomics and sugarcane genomics. And finally, I realize we have a lot of students here, so it would be great if I can just share some bioinformatics resources to make everyone's lives easier. So there's a lot of new faces, people who don't know me, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself first. I am from Tweed, Ontario, Canada. It's a small little farming town. Uh, I got my Honours Bachelor of Science at the University of Ottawa in Molecular Biology. I worked for a few years as a microbiologist doing uh, biofuel research in fungal genetics. Uh, I came to Australia in 2013, started my PhD with Robert Henry, investigating biofuel traits in uh, eucalypt hybrid trees. Uh, I have been uh, working in the US for the past three years, uh, having graduated from Coffee in February 2017. So this is where I work now. So this is the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology. Uh, it's located in Huntsville, Alabama in the US. Uh, it's a non, -pro it's a non profit uh, research organization. We do a lot of uh, plant geno uh, genomics, uh, human genomics. It's a pretty beautiful place to work. Uh, nice atrium, beautiful open space. And it's all lit up at night. It looks, looks really nice. It's a great place to, to be. This is the group that I work for. So I am in the Genome Sequencing Center. Uh, we are an affiliate lab of the Joint Genome Institute uh, as funded through the Department of Energy. So we do a lot of sequencing of bioenergy grasses and things that are of interest to the Department of Energy. Uh, this is our uh, sequencing group here. I'm one of eight bioinformaticians with the group uh, who work for Jeremy and Jane, uh, who have been with the center for 10 years. Uh, these two have, are responsible for sequencing half of the plant reference genomes that are released into the world. So a lot of, a lot of expertise uh, available here. So with every genomics talk, there's always this obligatory slide talking about how much, sequ how much sequencing has gotten cheaper in the past few years. And while this is true, I don't think anyone has really has an appreciation for how much cheaper it's gotten. So. Since 2008, there, when Illumina released their uh, shotgun uh, sequencers, it's come down dramatically in price. But we still get uh, 
conversations with collaborators when they're talking about sequencing a new diversity panel and they're talking about wanting to do a whole exome capture and you know what can we get away with what's going to be uh, cost benefit cost benefit in sequencing the the diversity uh, stuff and occasionally we get this question like this is the holy grail like can we do five to eight x coverage can we call SNPs and yes you can do that you can do DD rad seq but the real utility of plant genomics getting cheaper is that you can go above and beyond <coughs> and really do some interesting things. So that's sort of what I would like to showcase for you today, what you, what you can do when you get beyond just doing 5 to 8x coverage. So in generating uh, reference genomes, so one of the first uh, reference genomes that Hudson Alpha put out was the soybean in 2008. It was a, uh, the sequencing effort behind it was uh, 15 million Sanger reads 350,000 back sequences and half a million Sanger uh, Express sequence tags. Uh, the total production time to generate this uh, amount of data took 10 weeks. It ran on 120 Sanger uh, sequencers. Uh, the total cost of all these machines was about $30 million and it cost $13 million to generate. 10 years later, now we just combine uh, PacBio sequence cells, high C libraries, uh, a bit of Illumina, in much less time, in only four weeks of sequencing, we can generate something that is comparable for about $2,000, sorry, 2,200 <laughs> uh, cost reduction for a comparable product. So sequencing technology, then and now. So uh, the old Illumina data that we used to work with came off of the Illumina HiSeq 2500. You could generate about a terabyte of data per run, and it would take five days to generate each of these runs. It cost $40,000 to run. Uh, nowadays, we have the uh, NovaSeq 6000s. So in half the amount of time, we can generate about six times as much data. Uh, the cost to run it is about the same. And just as a pictorial visualization of what this looks like, this is the amount of data that you can generate per day, three terabytes. Whereas before, with the old uh, HiSeq data, we could generate about 200 gigabytes per day. Uh, same with PacBio. So this is our other workhorse that we have here at Hudson Alpha. So uh, back when I was doing our, my PhD, we had the PacBio RS uh, data. So in about two to four hours, you could generate uh, 500 meg of sequence. It cost $500 uh, to run it. Nowadays, we use the PacBio SQL. So we can generate 20 times as much data in 10 hours. Uh, the run cost has gone up, but per day we can generate about 20 gigs of data as it's composed to three previously. Just to get an appreciation of what that looks like in terms of the read length differences. So everyone has heard that PacBio produces long reads uh, sequencing, but I don't think you really appreciate how long those reads are until you see them in comparison to Illumina. So this is 150 base pairs. So this is the three terabases that we generate per day. But when we want to put together a reference genome and get through some really repetitive stuff, uh, this is what we use. We put together uh, genomes with PacBio. This is the Hudson Alpha sequencing farm. So when I first started, this room was full of uh, Illumina X10 uh, sequencers. Each one of them cost a million dollars. There was 10 of them, so $10 million sitting in one room. Uh, two and a half years later, they are all obsolete. They have all been replaced by NovaSeqs. So this is how quick the sequencing technology changes that. A $10 million investment in two and a half years is obsolete. Now you need to move on to the, the latest and greatest. So uh, the bioinformatics pipelines that we run uh, at Hudson Alpha mainly have to do with generating uh, plant reference genomes and population resequencing. Uh, the reference assembly is not something that I do personally, but I thought Considering the audience, this is probably something that everyone is very interested in. So we take PacBio libraries, combine them with Illumina that we, uh, to get contigs and scaffolds. We then use HiC libraries, genetic maps, or gene synteny to build up <coughs> chromosomes, and that ultimately gives us a new reference genome. So, but this is the, the, what I work on here, mostly population resequencing. So what sort of uh, analyses can you do when instead of just having a dozen Illumina libraries, when you have 50, 100, 500, and now we're getting up to being able to resequence about 1,000 of one particular species? What can you start to do when you start looking at that scale? So two of the projects that I'd like to talk to you about today 
is the sugarcane uh, data analysis and the generation of pangenomes. So pangenomes is what you can generate when you have a lot of the same sort of data, and sugarcane is a good uh, example of what you can do when you have many different types of data. So in one slide, this is how we generate uh, a reference genome for plants. So the first step, you need really good DNA. You can't have long reads without long uh, molecules of DNA. So the, the gold standard that we use comes out of the Rod Wing Lab at the University of Arizona. They have a lot of experience in generating uh, back sequences. So this is if, when we want a really high quality library, the, the DNA gets sent to them. Uh, once we get good DNA, we do a quick uh, Illumina library on them. It gives us the ability to actually visualize the genome with some of the tools that we use. We can look at uh, the ploidy level of the genome, how heterozygous it is, how much repeat content it has, uh, what organelles are present, and is it uh, contaminated with fungus or bacteria. So it, assuming that everything looks good at this stage, we then generate uh, some PacBio libraries. Uh, for an inbred crop, we, it takes probably about 70 to 80x coverage of just PacBio, and that's what we need to put it together. If you have something that's outbred, you probably need to collect a little bit more data. We then take all of that PacBio data and we assemble it into contigs and scaffolds uh, using long range uh, sequencing alignment. Uh, there's different kinds. There's, there's uh, the Falcon Assembler, MeCat, and Canoe. The one that we use currently right now is MeCat. It seems to be the best, uh, the best at assembling and sorting out alternative haplotypes within the sequence. And then we go through a polishing step using qu either quiver or arrow, just in case the assembler makes any glaring mistakes that can be resolved early on. Uh, we then go through and break any false joins that the assembler has made. So this is areas where it has generated a contig and has terminated at uh, repetitive content. And then that same sort of repeat content is found elsewhere. The assembler thinks that it should, these two things should be joined. So when we start to put together uh, chromosomes and integrate the data, we find these false joins using a genetic map or a high C library. We break these things and reorder, reorient based on uh, the maps or the high C data. We then go through and look at the data just to make sure that we have addressed any uh, haplotype issues and make sure that anything that could be uh, put back together uh, goes that way just to make sure that everything looks, looks right. And then finally, we go through a final polish with, uh, with our original Illumina library just to reduce any homozygous errors that popped up during, uh, that are present in the PacBio data. So that is putting together a reference genome, but this is what I do. So the sorghum pan genome. So this is my boss, Jane Grimwood, standing in a field of sorghum. So why do we want to sequence sorghum? Why is the Department of Energy interested? So uh, sorghum is a pretty, pretty critical stable, staple crop for millions of people around the world, uh, people living in Africa. It's also our number two bioenergy crop in the US. And in a few years, it's poised to becoming our premier bioenergy crop, which is pretty impressive considering the amount of corn that they grow in the US that is our current uh, bioenergy crop. It is heat and drought tolerant, and we have access to a really large and diverse uh, amount of germplasm. So the one that we've been uh, sequencing and working with over the past few years is the Biomass Association Panel, or BAP. It's a collection of 390 individuals that we've sequenced. It represents the five major land races of sorghum that are, that are grown as part of crops in Africa, Asia, and America. And it also represents the uh, major different grain types, such as sweet, grain, and cellulosic. So for this reason and the amount of diversity that's present, it's an ideal target for accelerated improvement using uh, genomics and phenomics. So the uh, Terra project that we have with the Department of Energy is interested in taking what we can learn using plant genomics and high throughput crop phenotyping to inform which genotypes should go into the ground, how are they likely to perform, how can we predict what's going to happen once they're there, can we use robots to uh, manage that field more appropriately? Can we constantly monitor everything using crop sensors? And once we have a good idea of what's going to happen in the field, can we do trait associations and look within a controlled glasshouse environment to say, here's what we think is important to the field. Can we actually go through and test it by changing things like 
uh, lighting, water use efficiency, things like that. So the phenotypes that we're constantly collecting from this data set uh, come from uh, visible light imaging. So we're always taking pictures of these plants through their development. We take uh, high resolution images just to see what the plant looks like, how it's growing, does it have a nice phenotype. We also take a look at uh, fluorescence lighting, looking at its chlorophyll content, what's the overall health of the plant, is it uh, diseased or is there something obviously wrong with it. And finally, we also take a look uh, at the, at, the, at the plant using near IR imaging. It allows us to look at what the water uh, distribution is within the plant and how the roots are, uh, what they're doing in the soil. So when we want to uh, get really high quality phenotypes of this data, the, these plants are all grown at the Donald Danforth uh, Plant Science Center. It's a 1200, uh, 1200 plant capacity uh, glass house where each one of these uh, genotypes is in a, uh, in a pot that is on a conveyor belt. And once, uh, once or twice a week, they get imaged. They go through uh, an imaging loop where uh, picture is taken using visible light near IR or uh, fluorescence, and then it goes back. And this is constantly moving just one, two times a week. You take, you take a picture just to see what's going on with it. And within this glass house, you can change things like uh, what nutrients you give the plant, what, how much water you feel like giving them. So the same genotypes are also grown out in Arizona at the Maricopa site. So these, uh, allow, this field site allows us to predict how they actually perform in the field uh, under normal circumstances. So this is the gantry system that actually has a, uh, a mobile sensing unit that goes through, sets down over top of a row of plants, takes images from both sides of it, and then goes to the next plot. So you can actually image them all the way down these rows using this large gantry system. So it's pretty, pretty amazing to, to watch. So that takes care of the phenotyping, but we've also sequenced all of these, uh, all these genotypes in the BAP panel to about uh, 40X coverage. So we have a really good idea of what sort of genetics are present. So this is an MDS plot. So. Uh, it's a way of scaling all of our SNP data onto a plot just to look to see how much variation is present within the population. And this is the overall structure that you get, you get sort of this triangle shape of the total amount of genetic diversity that's present in the panel. And what I'd really like to point out here is on this panel, we also have uh, the current reference genomes for sorghum. So we have BTS, BTX623, we have bicolor uh, Rio, which is one of the sweet sorghums, and we also have uh, RTX430, which is a grain type. So this is what we're currently using to study this total amount of uh, diversity. I think you can agree that there's, there's so much diversity that using reference genomes in this way is not necessarily the best, best co course of action. So we haven't even sampled on the main principal component of variation in the population. So because of this, we're actually uh, generating new reference genomes for each of these different clusters all along this continuum of variation. But this is gonna take a few years, so we thought, what can we do now in order to capture this large amount of variation here with what we have sequenced? So, I'm gonna take a drink. This is where the concept of the pan-genome comes in. So, the pan-genome is essentially the sum total of all genes that are present in a species. Uh, it breaks down from there uh, what belongs to the core genome, so what is essential to sorghum, what, what does it need in order to survive, and what is in the disposable or variable part of the genome. So within this set, I'm most interested in the shell genes, which are uh, those that are present within different subpopulations and are likely responsible for uh, local adaptation to different environmental conditions. So. This is how you build a pan-genome. So the first step that I do is from all of these uh, different accessions within the BAP panel, I go through and generate a de novo assembly for each to get contigs and scaffolds for each. I then take the closest reference that we have, which is sorghum bicolor, and I take all of the gene models that we have from the annotation and I project them into each one of those assemblies. So what that allows me to do is to order and orient those contigs based on the gene data. So I can get macrocyntony to build chromosomes, 
but also because I've used exons, I can order and orient small contigs to make sure I've put together genes properly to get them in the right orientation and then place that into a chromosome. So once we have uh, this information for all of the different uh, genotypes, so this is the, the, the pipeline that occurs for all of the 390. Once I have generated uh, all of these contigs and chromosomes across the whole panel, I go through and quantify uh, each gene at a global level and ask, are you there all of, the, all of the time? Are you there some of the time? And I can start to visualize these core and shell gene sets. And once I know what is variable in the, in the, in the population, I can start to do a more high level analysis of what's going on there. Of course, in order to be able to actually define what is in the core and disposable set, I need to be able to find out which genes belong to which. So this is a clustering uh, analysis that I do based on gene observation across the pan genome. So across uh, the 390 individuals, I just score them whether or not they're present or absent. I can then do a clustering to say there is a large population, uh, a large representation of genes that are never vary in the population. They're there approximately 98, 99% of the time. And this represents about 82% of all genes. The variable set has more fluctuations. So there is a, uh, a set of genes that looks like they have been generated either by error or they're only present in just a few individuals. There is a soft uh, gene set that is, it's sort of in between in terms of its variation. This uh, occurs when you haven't quite sequenced enough individuals to really separate uh, groups into core or shell. And then there are shell genes that are basically the midpoint for variation in the population. And they're the most, uh, they're most, they're the most useful for actually determining the population structure. And in this uh, pan genome, this represents roughly 6% of these genes. So when I uh, find this clustering, I pull these genes out and I decided to uh, do some clustering analysis on that just to see what the population uh, looks like uh, as a whole, sort of similar to the SNP MDS plot. So using multiple correspondence analysis, I took a look at the overall variation in uh, my shell gene presence absence variation. And I know this is a bit of a simple graph, but the first thing that I want to point out to you, this is one of the first plots I generated that I got really excited about because it started to have that triangle shape to it. And I realized, that I think I'm starting to pull apart the, the actual differences in the subpopulations using this technique. And I thought, well, I have all of this SNP information data. Let's do something crazy. Let's take that information and we'll just keep the same structure, but I'll just change the coloring to say, these are the subpopulations that are present in the SNP data and look to see how, how I compare. So that's what I did. I took the six uh, subpopulations that were present from SNP data, just changed the coloring based on their classification, and only a f handful of genotypes changed. So it, I've got a pretty good idea that I'm pulling out the actual gene, genic differences in these subpopulations, and I can properly classify them. What's nice about doing this analysis is that I can also take the, my gene set and run it through a structure to determine what's admixed in the population, what shares a lot of genes. In order to uh, remove anything that's admixed to get really tightly defined subpopulations. And this is what I use to uh, test for differences between these populations. So what is present in this population but missing here uh, and vice versa. What, what can I really hone in on once I can tightly cluster things with admixed populations removed? And the last thing I want to point out for the sorghum pan genome is the utility of being able to do an extra layer of GWAS analysis. So with all of these phenotypes that are collected, uh, we can imagine that people are doing GWAS with SNPs all the time. And for some of the genotypes that are, sorry, phenotypes that are collected in the uh, glasshouse, our collaborators came to us and said that we have uh, a significant SNP on chromosome six that seems to be popping up with water use efficiency and growth rate, but there's no obvious candidate gene that seems to be driving it. Can we use the pan genome to sort of determine what gene might be underlying that? 
So I took my uh, presence absence variation matrix, converted it into a VCF file, and gave it to the collaborators to rerun their GWAS. And we found the exact same thing again. On chromosome 6, we had this nice clustering of uh, significant genes that were popping up. In this 50 KB interval, uh, the water use efficiency and growth QTL, we found that most genes were pretty invariable across the different subpopulations, except for this one. When you look within uh, subpopulation three, it was only present about 5% of the time, whereas it was basically invariable ex uh, in population one, four, and five. It was about present about 50% of the time in subpopulation two. And when you pull this gene out and look at what its function is, it just so happens that it's an Arabidopsis drought association, association gene. So it was a nice result and uh, hopefully demonstrates the utility of generating these pangenomes. So that was the small pangenome. Let's move on to Ceteria viridis, the big pangenome that I've worked on. So uh, Ceteria viridis is a nice model organism for all of the panicoid grasses. A lot of my colleagues consider it a bit of a weed. It grows everywhere. It's not terribly interesting to other people other than scientists. Uh, what, what's nice about it is that it has a small diploid genome, about 500 megabases. Uh, it's closer reloaded related to different tetraploids, such as switchgrass and mythcanthus. It has a fast life cycle. You can get it from seed to plant in about six to nine weeks. It's drought resistant. It has C4 photosynthesis, and you can efficiently transform it. The center for domestication for uh, green millet, or Ceteria viridis, is actually in China. Uh, they domest uh, Chinese domest domesticated it about uh, eight to 10,000 years ago but we think it was actually introduced into North America via the uh, Russia-Alaska uh, land bridge that when humans came over. If you go looking for it in China, uh, our collaborators were visiting the Great Wall of China and just happened to find Ceri viridis growing in the Great Wall, uh, just where a bit of water collects. Uh, you can. Imagine that this is a really terrible place for a plant to, to grow. You don't get good sunlight, but yet Ceteria viridis seems to do just fine there. In North America, it's sort of the same thing. So where you find this plant growing is right next to highways and crevices next in sidewalks just about everywhere. And the reason that it's so successful and it can adapt to the places like this and uh, appear to be just fine is because it's a prolific seeder it can generate uh, 10,000 seeds per one plant. So all you need is just a few that are resistant to this sort of environment and it'll start popping up. So it can quickly adapt to different uh, environments. So uh, to study it, uh, we have this uh, population that we've collected across North America of 605 individuals. It's been collected over several years by this man here who, if you're wondering why there's such straight lines, he basically hopped in his car, drove down the highway, and every 400 meters, here's a genotype, here's a genotype. And he did this over several years. And if you're at all curious where, the, where he's employed and where the Donald Danforth Center is, it's right here in the center <laughs> where everything seems to, seems to lead back to. So we sequenced that uh, population to about 41x coverage, giving us a contiga N50 about 16 kb. Uh, in total, the amount of uh, genome that we were able to put together was about 322 megabases. And the amount of present genes that are present within each individuals on average is about 38,000 genes, which is this red line here uh, in this plot. So going through the same process again of going through the generation of the pangenome, uh, scoring things for presence absence. Uh, this is the, the total amount of variation that's present in the population. So what's nice about this is that there's no real selection event. So that's why you get this uh, much larger cloud shaped. You don't have anything that's gone through uh, severe bottlenecks. This is just growing out in the wild. So you'd expect a, a larger cloud of variation. And since we know where each one of these genotypes is collected from, I can take this gene presence absence variation, uh, these different, uh, these four subpopulations, and project them onto a map and see uh, where they're actually growing and what that looks like. 
So if you uh, project that onto a map, you can see that you get uh, four different subpopulations. Uh, we have one here in the south, uh, the lower Midwest, which is only really found right here in the middle, the upper Midwest uh, here in the US, and finally the population of Rockies. If you go through the same process of eliminating anything that's admixed, uh, typically what we found with Ceteria is that there were three main subpopulations, the Rockies, the upper Midwest, and the southern population, with the lower Midwest being mostly admixed between these two populations. So because we have such nice defined populations and we know exactly where they belong on a map, we can start to do uh, comparisons between them to find out what's really going on in this other population, what genes are present there, what, what it's missing relative to the Rockies, and do some really fine scale comparisons. So uh, across my pan genome, I can start asking questions like, between subpopulations, are these genes observed more or less than expected? And just do some global uh, statistics across them. Uh, we can see here from this plot that the upper Midwest and the Rockies population are the most different from each other. Uh, see a large amount of genes that are conserved here in the upper Midwest. Uh, that's why they're, they're found far more often than you would expect. In the southern population, they're largely neutral. They occur just as often as you would expect, but they have been lost when you uh, move into the Rockies population. So it's a pretty nice to be able to look at this from a global standpoint to see what's different between them. But these are genes, they occur on chromosomes, so why not take a look to see where these genes are actually missing when you look at a chromosome. So when I, uh, when I do this, I take uh, every gene that is significant, so as long as it has a p-value less than 0 0.001, and I put it into uh, 100 kb bins across each chromosome. And then I can look across each of the different subpopulations to say, do I have sets of genes that are overrepresented in the population and compare them to uh, across all the different subpopulations. And then you can quickly find that there are pieces of chromosome that, are, that, that tend to be missing in some populations. You can actually go in and fine scale say that the difference between upper, the upper Midwest and the Rockies uh, can be largely attributed to these genes in this particular set. So you can also go in and look to see what's actually going on. Is this a recombination hotspot? Is it purging things in here? Uh, is there more variation in this area with your SNPs? You can really start to, to look at what's different between these subpopulations. Uh, if I had all the time in the world, I could probably sit and analyze these pan genomes forever. Just off the top of my head, you can do uh, comparison of the core versus uh, shell global gene functions just looking to see what makes this grass grass, what makes sorghum sorghum. Uh, based on all of the other different references that we have, we can also take a look at non-orthologous gene sets. So what is present, uh, what, is, what is, appears to be missing in sorghum but is present in, in Ceteria, and take a look to see where those genes are. Because we can start finding genes that way that are missing in the reference. Either they're missing in the annotation or they're through an effect of domestication they've actually been lost. And you can potentially find new genes that are within these subpopulations and do really focused gene predictions in these hypervariable regions that you know you have a piece of chromosome that tends to be overrepresented in that subpopulation. And uh, just quickly with the shell genes, it's very easy just to pull apart and do functional analysis to see what, what's going on, but uh, what's different between them. So hopefully everyone is really excited about doing uh, plant genomics. They think it's great, it's really straightforward because I'm about to burst your bubble. This is another project that I work on, the sequencing of the sugarcane genome. Uh, this is a modern cultivar and this is what the genome looks like. So it has 10 base chromosomes, which is fairly straightforward, but the problem is, is that it is highly polyploid and has about 10 to 14 copies of each one of those chromosomes. So it's highly polyploid. The genome is about 10 gigabytes in size, so it's three times larger than humans. It is aneuploid, meaning that from one generation to the next, it can gain or lose entire chromosomes uh, virtually without consequence. It seems to be just fine if that occurs. Uh, each one of these copies of the chromosomes is very heterozygous. It is interspecific 
meaning that the genome is a result of two different species coming together into one species. So it has two parental components, and it is also recombinant. So those parental genomes have gone through recombination to generate brand new sequences that are present in the, in the, in the parents. So we got to this point by taking uh, Saccharum officinarum. So this is the high, high sugar content cultivar that is colonially propagated. It has 10 haploid chromosomes. It is octoploid, so therefore it has 80 chromosomes in total in its genome, which that's a lot, but at least it's a stable number. But about 100 years ago, the sugarcane breeders got together and decided to make my life more difficult by taking spontaneum and crossing it with wild relatives, uh, such as spontaneum. Spontaneum, uh, being a wild genotype, has a lot more disease resistance and genetic diversity in its, uh, in its population. But it also has eight haploid chromosomes, and its ploidy very wild, varies wildly from anywhere from 5 to 16x. So depending on which genotype you're looking at, it could have anywhere between 40 to 128 chromosomes. So. That's what we're working with. So the R570 genotype, the genotype that has probably been the most sequenced and studied over the past 20 years, uh, has an estimated ploidy of 10 to 14x. It has 115 chromosomes, 70 to 80% of which comes from the clonal cultivar uh, officinarum, 10 to 20% come from the wild type spontaneum, and 10% are recombinant. It is highly heterozygous, and it presents multiple distinct alleles at each loci. So, if you're going to sequence this, where do you start? So, thankfully, sugarcane is still mostly syntenic and collinear with sorghum. So, uh, before I started at Hudson Alpha, I think this was a project that Robert was involved in uh, with the Department of Energy in Hudson Alpha. They decided, because of this uh, conservation of syntony and collinearity, that if you collect a large number of back clones from the R570 genotype, and just ask how many backs does it take to walk between each of the homeologous chromosomes of sorghum? Can we uh, start to sequence the genome that way? So that's what we did. So this uh, chromosome four, the, 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 the single tiling path that we generated is essentially the minimum number of backs that it takes to walk from one end of sorghum to the other. So this was a Great sequencing achievement for the sugarcane community. This took a, a lot of time and a lot of amount of resources. Uh, the, the result was uh, published last year in Nature Communications. And it, the, the single tiling path represents roughly 382 meg of 10 chromosomes <laughs> of sugarcane. So this represents the really genic region of uh, each of these chromosomes. But it is still a mosaic or collapsed view of the genome. So it's each one of these chromosomes uh, represented in the single tiling path. Ideally, what we, we'd like to have is to keep e everything separate and generate a de novo assembly of the entire 10 gig genome to keep everything separate. So the R5 se sequencing effort uh, has been undertaken. So what it is is the combination of Illumina fragment, uh, Illumina library, X10 data, high c bio nano maps, PacBio, uh, yeah, a, a very large amount of sequencing data has gone into this, uh, over five terabytes of data to just sequence one genotype. And that's not even including the uh, 48 self progeny that we've sequenced to about 10 to 15 X coverage, just to leverage uh, differences in segregation to start looking at patterns of our markers across the genome. So if you're going to generate this much sequencing, you need an assembler that's gonna be able to handle it. So up until a few years ago, we didn't have the computational ability to assemble uh, a genome like this. Our, our usual workhorse for assembly, Miraculous, would just sort of sit and spin with this data and never actually complete. It couldn't resolve this amount of, of data. But it wasn't until more recently, uh, in 2015 and 2018, that uh, HIPMER was developed, which it stands for uh, High Throughput Paralyzation of Miraculous. This is our new uh, de novo assembler that we use. Uh, that we use at the Department of Energy and JGI. And when we first got it, we decided to set it loose on some of the largest plant genomes that we have. What's the most complicated data sets that we have? Uh, so we assembled red cedar with it, uh, Taxus, Jeff Pine, so genomes uh, on the order of 13 gig, 12 gig, 22 gig. 
and in one to four hours, uh, depending on the number of cores we use, we can now generate de novo assemblies for these genomes. So if it's able to handle something like Jeff Pine with a 22 gig <coughs> genome, how, how, will, how will it handle sugarcane? So my colleague at Hudson Alpha deserves all the uh, con con uh, congratulations for this. Uh, he took uh, 1.9 terabytes of Illumina sequencing and using our uh, Department of Energy supercomputing super site, uh, assembled the genome in roughly one hour using 5,000 cores of compute. So it was pretty amazing. What came out the other end was uh, 1.7 scaffolds with a scaffold N50 of 56 KB and a genome assembly size of roughly five gig uh, of data. So we were pretty impressed. This is just a, a pictorial representation of the genome. We were pretty impressed with how it came out the other end, but this is still a large amount of scaffold. Uh, how, how do you start to evaluate data like this? How much genic capture, uh, how, how many genes are present in here? How many linkage groups? Uh, we needed a way to really start to characterize what was actually present in this uh, genome assembly. So in the past, we've had a good amount of success uh, sequencing tetraploids using uh, camera-based analyses. So this is how we develop uh, sugarcane genetic markers. So the first thing we do is generate camers uh, across the genome. Camers are just short pieces of sequence that we isolate from Illumina reads. Uh, they're a variable length. So in this case, this is 80 base pairs. And the reason that we use these as our genetic markers is that they're capable of containing multiple SNPs and indels that we can use to uh, separate each of these homeologous alleles in really repetitive regions. And once you have these anchored within the genome, we can start to uh, link these sequences together over short distances or long distances, either using physical means, such as uh, library insert sizes, high c or PAC biosequencing, or we can do this statistically uh, using a genetic map. So, as I'm sure you can appreciate, generating a genetic map for a complex uh, polyploid is rather difficult. And that's because you need to account for whether or not you are working with an allo polyploid, where a hybridization event has brought together multiple chromosomes from different species, or are you looking at an auto, auto polyploid, where there is a duplication event and each of the chromosomes look uh, almost identical to each other? And how many alleles do you have? How many copies of this have you actually uh, are present in the genome? Well, thankfully, back in 1992, uh, Wu et al. described a method of mapping using simplex or single dose markers that are unique to a one allele in the genome. And the advantage of using these markers is that they actually, regardless of uh, the, how the chromosomes pair or how many copies are present, they always segregate three to one in a self polyploid. So just to give you a visualization of what that looks like, if you take a simplex marker, that's present in a polyploid species, and you cross it with itself. In one quarter of your offspring, there is a reduction in heterozygosity, and this marker gets lost. It's retained in the others, but th this offspring will lose that marker. If you have enough offspring, so if you look across the, f uh, the 48 individuals, and you notice that this marker is gone, and this one, and this one, and this one, and it's consistent across the, your entire progeny, you can actually use this information to determine that this, all of these markers are present in one linkage group, and you can use that to uh, develop a genetic map. And this has been done in the past uh, to generate genetic maps for R570. So uh, actually generating these uh, markers is not trivial. So how I do this, I take all of my Illumina data, and then I realign it back to my HIPMER scaffolds that were generated uh, using HIPMER. I then slide an 80 base pair window across each of the alignment files and extract out a consensus sequence from each of my uh, BAM alignments. And as long as this piece of sequence is unique and isn't found anywhere else in my genome, I retain it along with the information of what scaffold it came from and which window it was generated from. Uh, once I go through and slide my window across the entire genome, I was left with about 55 million uh, 80 base pair genetic markers. As I said before, the only ones that are 
that, that are the most useful are those that are simplex or belong to only one chromosome. So then I take all of my markers and I type them across the 48 offspring, just looking to see whether or not they're present or not. I look for those that have 3 to 1 segregation, which leaves me with about 1.6 million of these simplex markers. And with the help of my colleagues, uh, John Lovell and Olivier uh, in France, they were able to use join map with these markers in order to generate a genetic map that is, consists of 159 linkage groups and roughly 10,000 retained markers. If they're listening, <laughs> I don't know if they've tuned into this, but I need to apologize to uh, John Olivier for representing the amount of hard work of going from 1.6 million markers to 10,000 and linkage groups. This amount of work is a very large undertaking and it takes multiple iterations to go through over and over again. So I could, it's very complicated and I'm very appreciative to all the, their hard work. So once you have these uh, linkage groups and your markers, uh, I'd like to actually project them into my assembly and see how much is covered in, uh, in chromosomes. But you can imagine if you only have 10,000 markers and you align it to a five gig genome, the number of hits you get are going to be quite sparse. So because of the genetic map making process, we end up actually only keeping the best marker and throwing out those that have the same positional information, but they're just not quite as good. We only retain those that look the best in uh, the map. But I can use correlations between the simplex markers and those that are uh, in my linkage group and find out that these four markers actually represent the exact same amount of information as this marker here in the map. So I can take the, this much larger set and actually project it into the assembly and find, uh, manage, I, I can connect the de novo assembly to the genetic map and then find the best positions of each of these simplex markers in sorghum to really have a, a look at what's going on in the genome. So that's what I did. So this, uh, what you're looking at here, is each of the sugarcane linkage groups, one through 59 here on the y-axis. And each dot that you see is the best hit position of one of those simplex markers across each of the sorghum chromosomes. So you can quickly see that uh, some chromosomes are much better covered than others. Chromosome three looks to be pretty uh, heterozygous and everything has been split apart. Uh, chromosome six, there is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six copies of uh, that chromosome in the genome. On average, I get between six to 15 linkage groups per sorghum chromosome, and I am able to anchor about 1.2 gig of anchored sequence. And based on our back sequencing, we're actually able to determine that 10 of these linkage groups are actually derived from the uh, wild spontaneum. So this is uh, the current data set. Uh, I'd like to take just a moment to talk about some of the future work that we have coming down the line that's gonna make my job uh, much easier in sorting this stuff out. So with our colleagues in, uh, I can't think of, uh, the Czech Republic, sorry, couldn't think of the name of the country. Uh, they have developed a way of actually isolating single chromosomes from the R570 genome that we can sequence. Uh, this allows us to refine our linkage groups and simplex markers, develop new chromosome specific markers and uh, look at scaffolding misjoins and really genic rich regions. Uh, they, they isolate these single chromosomes by uh, staining, doing, doing cell prep and staining uh, cells and actually isolating uh, single chromosomes using uh, flow sorting and collection. We get roughly one uh, chromosome per PCR tube. We then take each one of those and we sequence them using Illumina. Of course, when we started to do this as a pilot project, we didn't know which homeologous chromosome we were actually looking at. So we had uh, the problem of taking uh, an Illumina library and actually determining what we were, which, which chromosome we had actually captured. I thought this was going to be straightforward because we have the single tiling path. You could just take the reads, align it to that, and you could easily tell which chromosome you're looking at. This is sugarcane, so nothing is easy. The, the, we actually found that the best way of doing this is to take all of the reads that come out of this uh, library and align them to sorghum uh, gene space in order to eliminate any of the repetitive content that is present in the library. And that allows us to quickly isolate that we are looking at a homeologous copy of chromosome four. Uh, what's neat is actually one of the libraries that we captured seemed to have a really strong signal on chromosome eight and chromosome nine. 
I thought this was just a fluke that a little piece had broken off and had floated into the tube and you had just sort of captured both of them independent of one another. But in using our simplex markers, we actually managed to find one of the ancient chromosome fusions that uh, has occurred within spontaneum. And we can tell that that's what we've actually uh, captured here. So that is the front end of chromosome eight in sorghum and the entirety of chromosome nine. So it's, having this has made my life much easier because I'm used to looking at simplex markers across the entire genome, whereas now I can look at just very specific focused uh, groupings. And lastly, what we've been working on is high C libraries with our sugarcane data. So high C libraries essentially take advantage of the compact structure of the chromosomes within a cell and cross-link. Uh, the libraries are cross-linked uh, chromatids that you can then use to take high C reads and scaffold. Oh, let me find a better way to explain this. I can use these high C reads that we normally use to organize things into chromosomes by taking things that are already uh, anchored in uh, sorghum chromosomes using our genetic maps, taking uh, regions that are probably have gaps and finding pieces in our assembly and pulling them into our map to really fill in these gaps and collapse things down uh, in our anchored sequence. So what we're looking to do with sugarcane is to essentially uh, mine our genomic resources. Can we use our simplex markers and uh, use that to refine uh, markers that we look for in the assembly? Can we use the anchors along with TACBio and really fill up this space in order to essentially capture the genic region and allele-specific assembly of sugarcane, keeping everything separate in order to look at the variation of which copies of genes are missing on the different chromosomes. Do we have alternative splice, splice sites? What has been truncated? In order to quickly see what's uh, different in the genome and really make an impact in terms of breeding. So uh, I thought I could just show you some of the community bioinformatic resources that we have access to. Uh, I, I do bioinformatics. I know not everyone does, but these are some of the things that I use and they've just made things so much easier. So I thought I'd share them with the group. You just might not be aware of them. So uh, when I want to do uh, reference uh, scale uh, comparisons between genomes, uh, I typically use Koji. It does a really nice uh, nice comparison between reference level genomes. You can do one-to-one -one dot plots between two, uh, two references. Uh, this will quickly pull out syntenic blocks between the two genomes. You can then uh, do synonymous versus non-synonymous calculations between them, uh, visualize what that looks like. You can determine what has uh, been tangibly duplicated between the two genomes as well. Uh, K-base and phytosome are, are two, two big uh, database resources that we'd really like everyone to have access to. Uh, so uh, the phytosome is where we house all of the DOE projects that we have sequenced. All of our reference genomes are there. All of the uh, transcriptome data that we have available is all summarized there. But more recently, uh, the K-Base initiative uh, has taken place. So this is the knowledge base of everything that the DOE has sequenced and it's an open environment for systems biologies to look at uh, plants, microbes, and uh, the interactions between them. What's nice about it is that it has a lot of pipelines and tutorials present on the site here at KBase. So if you want to do a differential uh, sequencing analysis, here's how you upload a genome. Uh, you can trim your reads with FASTQC and Trimomatic, uh, line the reads, uh, assemble transcripts, and do differential expression analysis. Uh, this is all free. It's there's no uh, cap on how much data you have present. And what's nice is that these tutorials actually explain why you want to do each one of these steps. So it's really great for students. I think it's, uh, it'd be perfect for them. And where it really shines is the ability to assemble and annotate microbial genomes and carry out uh, comparative and phylogenetic analysis. And if anyone wants to venture into, into the dark side of the command line world and they're ready to, to make the leap, I highly recommend uh, looking into using Conda environments. Conda, it, it's a package and environment manager for different softwares. So this is how we manage things when we uh, use different software types uh, in Linux. What's nice is that it has internal versioning controls. 
So once you put together an environment with everything that you need, so this is one that I've generated for uh, predicting genes uh, in a reference genome. Uh, you can put OrthoFinder in, Blast, Diamond, Exonerate, Muscle, Python, Bed Tools, and SAM Tools. You capture that into one little package. That package can be shared, opened by other people, and it's nice that everything inside the environment can talk to one another, so you don't have to worry about pathing information and things like that that I'm sure is very frustrating for many of you. Our IT guy absolutely loves Conda because now he doesn't have random uh, pieces of software that bioinformaticians have begged him to install just to run something a little bit faster or something like that. So we can take control and rather than having him install it for us. This is my contact info. If you have any questions about what uh, Hudson Alpha does or you have any sequencing questions or genomics, uh, this is how you can get a hold of me. I'm here in Brisbane until Friday, March 1st. Uh, if you're at all curious about what we do at Hudson Alpha and what goes on at the Department of Energy, we actually have two uh, conferences coming up. So we have the uh, DOE uh, user meeting coming up in April. This is in uh, San Francisco. Uh, it kind of highlights all the different work that we do at the with, that we do with the DOE. And uh, more specific to Hudson Alpha, uh, June 3rd to 6th, we have the Crops Conference. I believe the early bro early bro early bird registration is still available. And this is in partnership with the University of Georgia, just showcasing how uh, you can improve agriculture through genomics and talk about other the, the other things that we sequence here. Uh, it's a great venue. Uh, you get to have great beer underneath uh, the Saturn V rocket. And so there's a lot of rocket research that goes on in Huntsville. And uh, there's the replica of the lunar lander here. So we'd happy to for you to come over and have a chat with us. And quickly, I'd like to thank all of our collaborators that uh, all of this work goes into. This is just for the two projects, so there's many more in addition to that. And I would be happy to take any questions from the audience.